Hi. All right, let's get started with hello, my friends, and welcome back again. Welcome to today's Bowtie Convo, the Bowtie Conversation community known as the Bowtie Convo. And I'm your host, Dr. Bowtie Todd, and I'm excited to come back together again for another conversation and continue my personal mission statement, a mission where every day I seek to create spaces for all humans to belong and thrive together one bow tie combo at a time. To continue our learning series, today's bow tie combo will focus on understanding more about the diversity inclusion profession, and more importantly, to address our title, what's my role in champion DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, on and off the clock. But before we begin, um, a, friendly, a friendly reminder, if you will, um, around the community rules. We have simple rules for engagement, to have effective dialogue, the bow tie way. And it's a way of my personal favorite acronym. So if this is your first time joining us, or if this is our second time, you probably understand my acronym. But if this is your first time joining us, I'm gonna share it with you all. And it's in the acronym of the bow tie. And I think this is something that we, we should practice every day. And I hope that we practice throughout the dialogue of how to have effective conversations. And the first letter of any conversation, or the first letter um, to engage in any conversation is to be mentally present. So we know that we're not all physically in the same room, but we ask for this next 45 minutes together that you be mentally present. The next letter is O, open to new ideas. All of our panelists come from various perspectives and backgrounds, and we're not asking that you have to agree with everything. Uh, we're just asking that you be open, and we, we do understand that our panelists is their perspective, um, and it's their background, and yes, they do not speak for the entire industry or community, et cetera, so we wanna manage those expectations. Uh, the next letter is W, willingness. Willingness to share your perspective. Engage in the chat, engage on Facebook, uh, we would love to hear your questions and your commentary. Uh, and we want you know you to share your story. So willing to share your story and share your heart. And then we also see this as the hardest part of the bow tie. Um, if, you, if you really talk to people who wear bow ties or the, or the reason why they do not wear a bow tie is sometimes it's due to this knot in the middle. And it, they, they really are challenged around making that knot work. And we see that's usually a challenge in conversations. How do you tie it together? So how do you lead this conversation better than you came in? And that's just the simple rules for engagement. Um, and that's our rules for today. Uh, we wanna definitely have our, all our channels be safe and in a very respectful way. And so we uh, want everyone to be um, engaged, uh, but also be respectful. And that's the whole bow tie combo. So I'm so excited to be on this journey with you all. And I hope that today we will engage on Ravel and Connect to tie together and lead this conversation better than you came in. So some Zoom housekeeping rules, since we have um, a lot of individuals that's not only tuning in from live, but also in the Zoom, feel free to utilize the chat feature at any time. Um, introduce yourself if you haven't already. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, feel free to reshare this video, share your comments. Of course, um, at any time as a participant, um, you can submit any questions for our panelists. We will try to get to them and through them throughout the conversation. If you hear anything today that stands out, feel free to talk about it on social media or share your engagement utilizing the hashtag Bowtie Combo so we can continue the dialogue with you. So let's get started. I'm gonna get out of your way and I would like our all-star panelists to introduce themselves um, and their passion for the space today. And so I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off and I go from my left and right. Uh, let's start with Stephen. It's good to see you, Stephen. Hey, Doctor Bolta, how's it going? <laughs> it's going well. Let let our let our viewers know who you are and, and your passion for the space today. Absolutely. So, uh, my name is Stephen Johnson. Um, I serve as the leader uh, of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion at American Airlines. Um, I've been in this field uh, my entire career. I've been in American Airlines a little over three years, and um, I, I get to lead our employee resource groups, our communication, um, workforce analytics, um, our learning and development in the DEI space. And I am, uh, you know, super excited about my 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 job, but my passion into DEI um, really came from me growing up in the city of Detroit 
and, you know, being around so many people who look like me and then going to college and having the ultimate culture shock and wanting to, uh, to bring people together, right? There was this, this need um, to, to, to pull together in the right direction to get things done. There were these common threads that I saw. And so uh, my, my passions have led me through student affairs and working um, in fraternity and sorority life and then now into corporate. And so, um, you know, ultimately bringing people together and getting to a place of equity um, is, is why I do this work. And I feel like, Stephen, the last time I saw you was in London. <laughs> we were in London together, yes. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oh the, where the travels will take us. I know. Uh, yes, was, let's, 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 shameless plug as an airline person. Let's go back to London. Get on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> take us all. Totally, please. <laughs> it's, it's definitely really good to have you, Stephen. I'm Thanks, going on to our next panelists, the great Alessis. Please grace us with your presence. Look, I am super excited, uh, Dr. Jenkins, first of all, for you to have me uh, with this illustrious panel. Um, you know, this is just an exciting time in the, you know, diversity and inclusion area. I'm currently the head of multicultural marketing at Cadillac. So, um, you know, very strong brand with, you know, heavy presence in the U.S., but also, you know, worldwide and a really strong um affinity toward people of color from a very historic standpoint. I've worked in the automotive industry now right at 20 years. Um, at 10 of those 20 have been with General Motors and I've had the opportunity to have an international assignment abroad. So I worked in um, the culture space um, for GMC Buick, excuse me, GMC Cadillac, as well as Chevrolet in Dubai in the Middle East had the opportunity to uh, lead training, cultural training there um, from a perspective of, you know, how do people want to be treated? So, you know, that was really exciting. And how could we take our customer experience really to the next level? While I was there for that year and a half, I had the opportunity to also lead the marketing team and personally travel to 20 new countries. And so um, over my lifetime, I've had the opportunity to go to 60 countries, understand culture. I love people, you know, I love history. So, you know, it's been, you know, a personal passion, the type of work I do today. And so it just gives me an opportunity to really help communities. And so, you know, our focus now is specifically on African American, Hispanic American, uh, Asian American, and I'm also responsible for our LGBTQ uh, plus efforts. So really exciting space. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. It's so good to see you. Thank you for it's joining true. us today. Now, I will definitely go over to my mentor and my friend, brother, the great Reggie. Reginald. Reginald. Good to see you, my friend, and good to be with this illustrious panel. Um, just maybe a couple seconds for me to introduce myself. Um, so, as I mentioned, my name is Reggie Miller. And I'm the global leader of inclusion and diversity for VF Corporation. And many of you might be wondering, what is VF Corporation? Uh, well, we're a house of brands. We own 19 brands, uh, many of which you recognize, like Vans, the North Face, Timberland, Dickies, Jansport, just to name a few. Uh, so we're about a $12 billion company, 50,000 associates worldwide. About half of those employees are outside of the U.S. And we're in over 130 countries. Um, just a little bit about my background. Uh, if you go back 24 years, 25 years, for me that includes eight years in the U.S. Army and Army Reserves where I served over in Afghanistan. Uh, it includes 18 years with Walmart stores, if you've heard of that company before. Um, uh, a brief stint over at Tyson Foods, and I've been at VF for the last three years leading their diversity efforts, as I mentioned before. I'm really excited about this panel because for me, the work around inclusion and diversity was not something that I had to have as part of my job title for me to get involved. It's something that's been a personal passion of mine that I would have done and have done regardless of what function of the business that I work in. And so it's been sort of a dream to be able to now have this be my full-time job. I've been doing this work for a very long time um, and so excited to be on this panel today once again. Well, thank you. I'm excited to see you as well. Uh, and last but definitely not least, someone who I admire greatly. She don't know how much of a huge fan I am, but I am, so, you know, such a huge fan of yours. And thank you for uh, being with us today. 
please let the world know who you are, Miss Jennifer. And I think you're on mute. Uh, just a little bit, just a little bit. See, just a they, little they, bit. They're, they're not ready for your awesomeness. They're not ready. I know, they're not ready. just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a buildup. Thank you. I, I am honored. Thank you so much. And I, this panel is so impressive. Um, I'm so excited to meet all of you. I'm not sure we've, we've all met. Um, and I'm really excited to learn from all of you tonight. Um, so my story, uh, I've been a, a, an owner of a firm that performs DEI strategy support and training for organizations of lots of different sizes, um, typically big companies. And um, I'm also a member of the LGBTQ community and I came out in my early 20s. So I've been out for a really long time, seen a lot of amazing changes during those years. And, um, but that really informs my passion for this work because I was the closeted employee. I was the person that wasn't bringing my full self to work. And, you know, it kind of broadened out from there in terms of my passion for making sure that each one of us can bring um, that full self to work to feel welcomed, valued, respected, and heard, and that we can do our best in a culture belonging and, you know, feel feel what that feels like and, and experience that. And so we get to build that every day, which is just such an honor. Um, and my background is in, I, I was actually an opera singer. <laughs> uh, so I was, I came to New York to make it, it didn't work out <laughs> clearly, but I found something so much better. Um, I actually lost my voice due to some broke vocal surgeries and I had to reinvent and I found my way into this field, which is leadership development, organizational change. And I, um, I sort of ran with that. I, I set out my shingle as an entrepreneur. I'm a proud woman-owned business and LGBT-owned business. We get certified in these things. And companies on this panel are the kinds of companies that seek out the services of a company like mine because um, having a diverse supply chain is really important to companies like this. And um, I know you're all, you know that whole um, uh, conversation about supplier diversity too. So yeah, we, um, we're just really, we're, We've been flexing through COVID, obviously. And then, um, you know, right now we're just inundated with requests for assistance. Um, many companies are coming online with this and saying we're not doing enough. And I'm relieved. I'm sad that it took a pandemic and, you know, the killing of George Floyd and many others. But um, maybe we're finally going to roll up our sleeves and get some real change and lasting change, you know, things that we can fix once and for all that we've kind of been dancing around for a long time. And I'm, I just want to say finally that I feel very called as an ally and, and actually an accomplice these days. And I, we can go into the difference between those words a little bit later, but um, regardless, it is somebody in your corner. It's somebody who is aware of their privilege and they're ready to use it. Um, and that's more of what we need to see on the part of people that look like me. And so that's a big passion for me in terms of where I focus my work. Wow. Thank you so much. I, thank you all. I'm just, you know, I'm just really just want to sip and just, I'm, and that's, the, that's the great thing about this. I am just here to facilitate. And I'm so happy that you all are here um, with us today. And one of the reasons we lifted up to Jennifer Point, uh, Jennifer Point, one of the reasons we lifted up today's conversation is because we continue to see many organizations struggle to increase diversity and aim to embrace inclusion. Um, and so we find ourselves at a crossroad. And it seems as when we have these social waves hit locally and globally, so does the emphasis on the profession of diversity and inclusion and creating roles, teams, and initiatives. And we are seeing that. And, and one of the many requests uh, that reached out for learning was, you know, what is DEI? What is the profession? How do we get started? And so Jennifer, someone who is a sought after speaker and consultant in this space, and you authored several books of inclusion, uh, will you share your perspective and kick us off with the reflection of DNI as a profession and, and where we currently stand today? Oh my goodness. Well, I think everybody on this panel will agree it's been a roller coaster. It always has been a roller coaster. Um, I think before COVID, we felt, even on the best day, I felt just speaking honestly here, you know, it's, it's the struggle to be sort of push, push your way into the conversation and, and make this not a nice to have, but a need to have. And it's been, this is why we always lead with the business case when we talk about 
the importance of this so that it will appeal to leaders with power in, to invest in this. Um, but it's been hard um, over the years. We've gotten much better. We have enlightened companies now who are really doing work, but um, it's been, I found it very, that takes up a lot of my energy instead of really like doing the work. It's like, we've got to fight for why it's important. And I do, I know everyone on this panel is an expert at doing that, right? We have convinced, we've cajoled, we've pressured, we've, um, you know, browbeaten, we've shamed, you know, every, everything in the book, you know, we have to just get people on board because we know it's good for the organizations. We know it's good for their future viability. We know that customers want it. We know that employees desperately want to be seen and heard and they don't feel seen and heard. So this was pre COVID. Um, then in COVID, I think it was, oh my goodness, like, what's going to happen to our our jobs lots of jobs but i think also for dni was it going to be viewed as critical and it again it came down i think to i'll be interested to hear what other people say like you know the the commitment that really tested the commitment i think for some companies um to see are we really in this you know for the long haul do we view it as a necessity um for our success to, and pivot out of this in terms of innovation and whatever's next um and then right now with the so with the movement for black lives all of a sudden the wave kind of the pendulum totally shifted and now um we're our expertise and our knowledge is so seen as so valuable to navigate help navigate companies that are scared that don't know what to do um and um i know for me I, I see a lot of companies right you've got some leaders here who are embedded in one but it's the what i see is a lot of companies starting up DNI initiatives for the first time, um, starting to build out their strategy, which we're we often helping them with. They, by the way, they want it yesterday, and you can't build a strategy in a day. <laughs> um, but so it's good. I want it to last. I want it to be real, and I want to make sure we don't rush because I think this what's important needs to take time. Like it shouldn't. It's disrespectful to rush a process as important as aligning a strategy, making sure it, it speaks to the business priorities, making sure the um, stakeholders are, you know, appropriately have the, have the buy-in and the leadership is ready to take that on. But I think we're, I think a lot has changed. So I would love to hear others, you know, what has, how do you sum up what has shifted in our field? You know, even in the last six months, it's been seismic. Yeah, no, I, you know, I agree. And to that point of, you know, it's very interesting as a practitioner in this space and seeing how things move. Um, and to your point of everyone is starting in different um, different levels and elements of this. And some people are still, you know, asking the question of, you know, what is the case for inclusion? I, I won't give my opinion uh, on um, or how we engage with that, those individuals who are still looking for the case and the business case, uh, but it is different ways of looking at this. You know, people, I tell people it's three cases. It's a social case, you know, the world, the community is changing. It's a moral case, it's the right thing to do, but it is a true and valid embedded with proven research, a business case. And you may not like it morally or socially, but when it will impact your pocket. And most times I see people, uh, change their mindset when it impacts their pockets. So I'm curious to know, Reggie, as an executive in the inclusion space, you know, and the opportunity to work with so many brands um, of the world, because to Jennifer point, considering the recent events around race and dealing with the crisis of COVID-19, um, how have you seen in your, in your practice the mindset is shifting with companies um, anything with the business side or employment engagement, um, engagement, if you will, around the discussion of like race and equity on the clock? Um, what is your perspective? Oh, and, and I would just echo a lot of what Jennifer mentioned before because it, it was it was very interesting in not only the tone and tenor um, as we um, all began to um, understand the gravity of not only all the deaths that take place, but just the inflection point that happened when we saw the murder of, of George Floyd. Um, and so for us, we had to go quickly and turn into how do we both have an internal perspective on, on this, but also an external perspective on, on this as well. Um, because what we were seeing from customers, to your point, was they truly want to know um, that the companies, our brands in particular, also align with their moral values. Um, and so from an internal perspective, um, it started with getting alignment from our senior leadership team. And so we spent some time on the Saturday after Memorial Day 
just being very crystal clear about not only what the CEO's expectation was about how the company was going to move forward, um, but also balancing that with what we needed to do for our associates because we needed to, to act quickly. Um, from an external perspective, um, there was also a quick call to action to say that many of our brands, if not all of our brands, needed to respond in some sort of way. Um, and so we were really parallel pathing with continuing to find a place for healing for our internal associates. So things we did were like um, a moment of silence um, with our internal associates. We did several listening sessions to just give people an opportunity to get what they were feeling in their heart off their chest. Um, we did a session on um, allyship to advocacy, which I think is probably similar to being an accomplice, um, so that people had an understanding of how to engage, um, while at the same time really focusing in on what does it really mean from a brand perspective to have an authentic relationship with African American community or with any diverse community as well. Um, and so the process that we're working through, as I know many others are working through as well, is um, how not only to pull together that action plan, but but how do we make it sustainable and relevant for the long term? I think you know, for mentioned that as, as well. But I think the difference, um, at least that I've seen and that I've heard from many other peers as we've walked through this, is there there has been an openness to really seek to understand um, that that hasn't been there in the past, right? Or or maybe hasn't been there to the degree that it has been um, that we've experienced over the last month. Um, and so one of the things that we did is um, days of reflection where we closed stores, we closed distribution centers, we closed offices and said, hey, take a day, go out there and learn. And so many of our associates were watching documentaries and sharing resources and articles back and forth and listening to podcasts um, and really trying to understand what the issue is so that they can be, once again, an advocate for, for the, the Black community throughout all of this. Um, and so that change, that really authenticity around really wanting to learn and, and understand, I think has been the, one of the biggest things that I've seen over the last five weeks or a month. And I think it's really set the stage for this to be an inflection point within our company, and I'm sure many others, on how do we do this in a way where there is more advocates and and accomplices to help us really do this. Um, now, to some degree, we're having to pull people back because um, you know some some of our groups are are going out there, and, and there's a rush to get something, just something out there. Um, and, and what we're saying, obviously, is we want something that is once, as I mentioned before, sustainable and actionable. Um, so one of the things that we did just recently is just. Yesterday, we had the kickoff meeting for an advisory group that is going to be solely focused on racial inequality for the company, and they will pull together our enterprise action plan, focus on how we're going to address it. So, so it's been an interesting five weeks for us, something that has been, uh, I think, very enlightening for me. I feel like I've learned a lot as well, um, but I think that those are the kind of things that is going to be important to the path forward is both the consumer expectation that you're doing something, but even the employee expectation that you're doing something. As well. No, that's really good. And I, I think to your point, you know, um, I was also learning how quickly um, organizations can put out a statement. Um, I, you know, that's what I learned. I'm like, whoa, you know, I, I, I heard from everybody. I mean, everything that touched anything in my household, I, I, I got something on my uh, Netflix. I got something my my little brother got something on his uh, PlayStation device. I mean, I was like, whoa, this is very, very interesting. Um, the power of a statement. Now, um, once again, I'm not a panelist, so I won't give my perspective um, on um, the power of statements. Uh, but I am curious to know, uh, I would definitely want to go to you, Alexis, someone who has definitely worked with so many uh, markets around the world. Uh, one of the most common questions I, I receive um, is, Todd, you know, we've been learning, we're trying, you know, our company is um, really invested in communities of colors, um, as well as even service organizations. I, 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 a lot of service organizations reach out and say, hey, 
you know, we want to work with communities of colors. We're mostly all white, uh, but where do we start? How do we reach out? What do we say? Um, and so I'm curious to know someone who's um, someone who's worked with so many different markets and um, with the cultural intelligence that you have. What are your advice um, to individuals who are leaking, or seeking, excuse me, to go beyond a statement and also start to get more engaged with um, various communities that look different than them? Yeah, no, great question. Hopefully everybody can still hear me clearly. Yes. I think one of the key things is really, um, first of all, decide who your organization is. So th there's only one of two types of organizations. One that has already been doing DNI, multicultural work, and one that has not. So when we think about, if we just start foundationally, if you think about making a statement, you need to make it from the place of where you are and who you are. You don't need to make a statement just to make a statement because the our audience, our consumers, you and I and everybody on this line, we know what's you know not authentic. And so it doesn't count. And so if we think about the statement, for, for example, that Cadillac made, we made it a week later. You know, we didn't make it on the, the first weekend, the first couple of days. We really wanted to, one, make a statement that would resonate with the community and that was honest from a brand perspective. But two, we wanted to talk about the actions. And so to a couple of um, the, the people earlier, you know, making a statement is easy. There are amazing marketing firms that'll help you make statements and advertisers. Doing the hard work, laying down a foundation of we never did this and so this is what we're gonna do or, or we in it to win it and now we're moving forward, you, you've gotta communicate that. So once you decide, okay, you know, where are we at it, you know, towing the line, then it's about, you know, what's the right action that you can sustain? So, you know, if you can sustain, uh, whether it be, you know, celebrating Juneteenth every year, if that makes sense for your organization and you can s sustain that, then do it. But if you can't, then don't, because it's not helpful to employees. You can celebrate Juneteenth, but if you don't have, you know, you got less than 3% African-American employees, you're not really doing anything. It's not sincere, it's not authentic. And if you think about the people who are on the right side of what's happening now, whether it be the Netflix, the Ben and Jerry's, you know, Cadillac even, um, we're trying to really be sincere. And so whatever companies decide they want that is the right path for them, um, obviously le leveraging many, you know, multicultural resources. I think that's um, also a big gap. You know, people are not looking for your interpretation of how they should feel or what you think would work for them. These listening sessions are so important. We listen to our dealers. We listen to employees at the dealership. We listen to um, employees internally. We listen to our customers. So that listening has to be very broad. But then two, when you come back to the action that you're going to take, that should be a multicultural agency that's helping you work on that. So you come back in a very sincere way with a sincere voice that resonates with actionable things that are really helpful to communities of color. And so, you know, again, those are just some, some basics and fundamental things that um, organizations, you know, can do if they haven't started. And then if, if they're already in the field doing amazing work, it's time to double down. You know, it, it just simply is time to double down. Yeah. That's really great, great points there. I, you know, I always tell organizations first, let's start with your values because your values will set you free. They will. They will set you free. Um, if you don't value diversity, you don't value people, therefore, we, it's no need to have this dialogue. But if your values is truly diversity and your people, you already know what you need to do, right? You need to put those things in sustainable efforts. Um, and it's not up this like if or should. Your values will set you free. Um, yeah. with, that, with that perspective, I'm curious to know, uh, um, speaking of engagement, and anybody else can weigh in on this, um, any recommendations around uh, reaching out to diverse communities? Or Alexis, if you want to give us your perspective as well, uh, because I do feel like this is something that is very, very uh, challenging for organizations, or let's say community organizations that uh, is not as diverse. Yeah, I would say start with doing your research. You know, we, we Google every single thing. If a company wants to do anything, they have true metrics around it. So I, I would say one, 
Um, start with your own internal research to find a partner who's a subject matter expert at you know understanding these civic organizations, what they do, the bottom line, where are these donations going to? In some cases, some of these donations are going to political campaigns. In other cases, some are really going to grassroots and um, civic organizations that are really doing the work. You know, so so the research piece is something that can never be. Um, you know, overlooked, you know, as you start to look at all of the organizations um, with Black Lives Matter in their title, many of them do many different things and serve many different groups. And so I say, you know, with executives at companies or, you know, social groups, you have to do your research leaning on someone else or just you know where can we throw our money now that's not value either so so research to me is is one of the biggest easiest um things that every you know company can do good point i love it and so what alexis oh, said and add a little bit as well um one of the key things almost goes back to to todd uh college recruiting if you want to be honest and that is the fact that you this can't be a show up one semester and then be gone sort of situation. So whatever relationship, whatever organization, whatever community you're engaging, engaging with, it has to be one where it's going to be for the long term, right? Because the, it'll be truthfully the death of you if you come in and, and do something really quickly or just write a check and leave. Um, they will understand that how inauthentic that is to Alexis's point. Um, and so really understand that after you do your research that you, if you're engaging with this group, it has to be a long-term engagement. Totally agree. Totally agree. And speaking of subject matter experts and all that it takes uh, to do the DNI work, Stephen, I definitely want you to weigh in on this. Uh, I, will, I would love for you to tell everyone, um, typically people are saying, hey, we need a diversity task force. We need a, a diversity leader. Um, and some people don't even know what that means and what does it take. So will you give us some insight, uh, potentially like your day-to-day -day work and, uh, and also some of the things that individuals or organizations should keep in mind as they look to lift up these type of strategies or initiatives or positions? Sure. Like most people who are in this profession, um, I have what I want to do every day, and then I have what actually <laughs> happens every single day, right? Um, you know, being at an airline uh, currently, you know, I, I also, you know, we're we're in a B two C, right? We 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 have a service and we provide it to customers, and you know, anytime you you provide a service to customers. Uh, things are, are, are bound to happen, right? And so uh, we oftentimes have situations that we need to go in and, and, and investigate and mitigate. And some of them involve racial bias or uh, homophobia or, you know, xenophobia, like any of those things, right? So those things often come up and they don't uh, tend to announce themselves beforehand. Um, and so oftentimes we find out from social media and other sources like, okay, how are we going to get around this? How are we going to get I'm ahead of this. So, you know, that's one piece of it. You know, I, I think in a, in a normal day to day uh, for me, you know, in a company where we have established uh, employee resource groups, right? We have 20 of them. Uh, they, they run the gamut from uh, experience, right? We have a family matters group that is all about family, right? No matter if that family is blended, if it's single parent, if it's same sex, um, we have, so that's one in the spectrum. We also have a Muslim employee resource group and a Christian employee resource group. And those are, are very uh, linear. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to be obviously a, a member of the Christian faith or Jewish faith or Muslim faith to, to go there, but those are places for them. So um, in a day to day, you know, it's, it's about keeping those groups, uh, you know, up and moving. Uh, one of the big things that we, we learned over this, this past year is that we don't tell our stories enough. Um, you know, I think as, as diversity practitioners, the work that we do is humbling because we feel like it should be just there. And so we don't really take, you know, hold of the reins to say, hey, and by the way, we got, you know, 15 pride parades this year, right? We, we don't really do that. And I noticed that in not doing that, we don't, we, we sometimes do a disservice to those who are looking for us to do this. So, so to Alexis's point and Reggie's point, you know, when, when, when statements come out sometimes, it's like, well, we ain't been hearing from you all this time. What, you, what have you been doing um, in this work? And so 
um, you know, the, the day-to-day runs really runs the gamut of, of running the resource group pieces and then going all the way down to telling stories, um, looking at workforce analytics, working with our college recruiting team, uh, working with our MBAs, right, our, 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 our leadership program. So there's a lot that we do, a lot of touch points that we have. Um, you know, for those, I would say, who are looking to, to start or to jump into this work now, um, one of the questions that we've heard, and much, much like most companies, we've, we've been listening. We've been having listening sessions. Um, the question that has stuck with me from our very first listening session was, why now? Why are you wanting to do this work now? And um, it hit me like a ton of bricks, right? I, I, as someone who does it every day, to have someone raise that question, right? I, I, my, my company is, in, is headquartered in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, at the end of last year, a Tatiana Jefferson was shot in her home by a Fort Worth police officer playing video games with her six or seven year old nephew, right? If something were to happen at headquarters, the police department that would come is the Fort Worth Police Department. We said nothing, we did nothing, we didn't acknowledge anything, right? And those are the, those are, those are, that's a real feeling that people have. Why are you doing something now? And so for all of those who, who, who want to jump into this work now, yes, you have to do it. But you also have to ask yourself, why are you doing it now? Is it for the, is it for the right reason? Is it sincere? Um, and if it is, you're going to need a lot of patience, right? We, we, <laughs> that's probably number one. A you lot, don't, Lord. I you don't, that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going you're gonna to get tired. <laughs> uh, but you don't get to turn, you know, if you, if you're, if your representation is, you know, your, your, um, your non-minorities make up 85, 90% of your representation, you're not going to flip that overnight. Right. Um, and that's usually what people see. That's the visual, visual, visual representation of diversity. Um, and so um, patience, right. That's one thing. You're also going to need buy-in. You're going to need buy-in from stakeholders. You're going to need buy-in from the top. Um, and usually buy-in from the top comes fairly easy, right? Because you talked, you talked about this, that business case, that pocketbook case, <laughs> they, they jump on board really easy. But that mid-level manager, right? That manager who, who has statistics and uh, who's, who's measuring the operation, who's measuring metrics, who's measuring uh, how the stores are doing, how sales are doing, this is now one more thing for them to have to care about. So you need buy-in at every level of the organization. Um, so those would probably be my two foundational pieces of, of what you need if you're just now jumping into, um, into this work. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, frozen I, I, middle, Jennifer. I love that what you just put in the chat, Jennifer, the frozen middle. And, 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 I, and, I, and I do want to echo that, and I want to remind people, reiterate this work uh, it's not a standalone department work. It's not an HR work. It is a company. It's an ecosystem that you must impact to embed DNI, diversity and inclusion, in entire an entire life cycle of an employee and when they leave your work. People sometimes we focus so much on what we do on the clock because that's what we're focused and that's what we get paid to do. But DNI go beyond to what happens on the clock. And that's one of the purpose of the title is what is the role of DNI off the clock? So um, how are companies showing up in communities? Um, you know, to the point earlier, where's the philanthropy dollars and where, how are they aligning with the communities that we say that we are uh, targeting or prioritize and emphasizing, right? Um, and how are we showing up, you know, on the weekends, et cetera. So I'm curious to know from the panel, um, what is your thoughts on how, what is the role does DNI play off the clock uh, from a company perspective? And then I'm going to shift it to organizations that are volunteering. Anybody have a perspective? Yeah. Hey, this is Alexis again. Yeah, I think, um, you know, organ organizations, company, businesses, um, they have a huge responsibility to really serve the community they're in. I'm in Southeastern Michigan in Detroit. Much of our philanthropy and our money is spent right here at home in our backyard in Detroit, you know, serving a community of over 80% of, of, of the metro Detroit um, community that we serve. They're African Americans and Hispanic Americans. And so much of our dollars that we give back here are automatically um, serving the community. And I think um, the people who get a lot done in this area, this DNI space, this multicultural space, they own it. So it's not today, you know, I'm, 
I'm focused in doing, you know, this and then tomorrow it doesn't matter. You know, whatever job I go on to do or whatever aspect um, of life, you know, wherever it takes me, this is still at the core of who I am. And even before I had this multicultural role, I still had this genuine interest in community, in people, you know, serving as a deacon at my church. So always, you know, ready to serve. So it's not like, it's like a mom. You you can't turn it off. You, your mom's just adding her a workload, you know, at work, at home. She's adding the school teacher and a couple of more roles um, to it. So, you know, the best companies, you know, they allow employees to have opportunities and time to spend outside of work, um, but in serving the community. And then they also, obviously, you've got to give back, you know, um, one of the main things that that we see awakening now is that people aren't waiting for the government and local legislator later to change to you know ignite this change that needs to happen in America. They're calling you know big brands and company out companies out saying you need to be a part of this change. You have to own this. You have to help us with these issues. And so. 50 years you know, ago, it was not the same, um, you know, the same focus, but today companies are being seriously held accountable for serving, uplifting, helping um, the communities that they serve, and also helping their employees. So it's not about just being thankful for a job and, and you, you know, stay over there and keep quiet. It's about, you know, your job needs to be fulfilled. Um, you need to be seen. You need to be, you know, comforted. You know, people need to have empathy. Uh, you need to bring your whole self at, to work. So, so all of those things mean that somebody has to make space. People have to begin to listen. You know, the only way for, you know, board of directors to change is that someone has to leave. Someone has to make space. And so that's why the listening and talk back sessions are so important because, you know, these topics don't just, you know, these changes don't happen in a vacuum. And so you need, you know, to Stephen's point, you need the entire, you know, ecosystem uh, inside your job as well as outside that community. Everybody needs to be working together for success and change, sustainable change in this, you know, in this area. Very great points. I, I, I'll go ahead, Stephen. I was like, just real quick, you know, I think one of the, the key things around doing this, this work on and off the clock, but especially as we think about, you know, what equity means, what inclusion means, this is not a zero sum game, right? It's not pie. It's not pizza. It, it's not because Alexis gets a seat at the table. I now have to, we, we are sophisticated educated people that learn how to build more chairs and more tables and, and we have enough space to do that right so it's important for us not to conflate this idea of if we do this you know we lose white men if we do this we erase christianity if we do that right Th those aren't the games that as practitioners we play i promise you right it's about how do we also pull up to the person who um, wants to bring their religion to work in a way that allows everybody to do that, right? How do we align with the person who um, is, you know, has a, a picture of their spouse, but it's a same-sex couple um, and not be harassed at work, right? So those, that's what we're asking for. That's what we, and we do that work. We have to be able to do that on and off the clock. Gone are the days when you could come in and say, uh, well, I'm at work now. Everything that happened to me before I clocked in is like, that's, that's not true, right? If I got a flat tire before I come to work, it's going to bother me all day. Like, it's not going to just go away because I crossed over to this threshold. Um, it will be there every single, you know, while I'm at work. So um, we have to remember that we're not playing a zero-sum game where someone has to lose for other people to win. Great point. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you said that because it's many times when many organizations that I work with, they hear the word diversity um, and, and they hear inclusion. And most times white, straight, old men is like, you're not talking about me. So I'm not going to that session. They're not coming to the webinar tonight. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not for me. And people, when you really understand the true fabric and spectrum of diversity and inclusion, it's really inviting all people, all backgrounds, et cetera, to the table to feel as if they can belong and be seen and heard. And I tell people all the time, you know, you cannot just show up to and put on your DNI hat today and say, ooh, I'm gonna be so diverse and inclusive. And then you turn that off time you go home. 
because we have seen in research and we have seen in practice that you will show up how you show up at home when you least expect it at work. In your times of discomfort, your time when you have to make quick decisions and you don't have all the information, you go to, you result to uh, your bias and your assumptions. And so if you are not practicing off the clock, you know what you will practice on the clock. So I digress, but I would love to get you guys thoughts on community organization and service organizations because we are seeing a lot of organizations that are volunteer based and volunteer led wanting to reach out and, and, and really get behind supporting um, inclusion work. Any advice um, for um, service organizations around uh, and community leaders of their role to play in this work or, um, you know, recommendations to them if they want to get started, et cetera? Anybody want to take that? Jennifer? <laughs> I have to say, I might want to punt on that one because I don't get it very involved with that. Um, but does anybody else have any any insights on that? The art of doing that. So I'll 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 jump in after Reggie. I've I've spoken, so I want to yield to Reggie if you get something. No, I, I, you know, Stephen, we can work on this one together. How about that? Um, you know, one of the things that's also also interesting engaging with some of the community um, NGO and civic organizations is. You know, there's always, there always has to be alignment between um, what you're trying to solve for and what they're trying to solve for it as well, right? Um, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is the fact that many of those organizations are obviously uh, based off of donations. And so they're very lean in the way that they're funded. And they're also very, um, uh, they have to be very prescriptive in regards to what they're going after. Um, and so I think it goes a lot back to what Alexis talked about in, in research, 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 because you want to be able to align with the right organizations that will not only help them achieve their mission, mission but also help you achieve what you're trying to go after it as well. Um, but in that, I think there is there are opportunities and there are also minefields as well, right? Um, because um, a one-time huge donation um, may definitely fatten up their coffers, but leave them in a vulnerable position for the next year as well. And so um, it, it's really, uh, going back to the word that I think we've all talked about, it's, tr it's really about partnership. Um, and it's also about really making sure that we, you can um, invest in the type of community organization that's going to also allow for your employees to potentially get involved as well. You know? so, so whether you're talking about some aspect of racial injustice, or some other organization within the um, IND space. It, it, it has to be very targeted and, and pointed in that relationship. Um, one quick thing I'll add before I pass it over to Stephen um, that, that I didn't get a chance to say on the last question is, is I'll just reemphasize the balance that you have to play as a DNI practitioner as well, right? Um, so a perfect example of that is, um, you know, I have recently got some feedback from our team over in the Asia Pacific region and specifically Hong Kong. Obviously we know that there's been protests going in Hong Kong for over a year now. Um, and, and the feedback was good feedback that says, hey, how come the, the reaction to protests in the US is different than how you reacted to protests here, right? And so the job of a DNI practitioner or an organization to make sure that there is an equal level of response, you know, obviously where appropriate and also across different groups um, is also a big component of what we do as well. So, Reggie, you know, I would add to that, Todd, that, you know, the harsh reality, at least for us, um, the, the model we've come to, to realize is that we can't be everything for everybody, for, for every community group, right? Um, there are a lot of wonderful groups out there and, you know, if we could give to all of them, we absolutely would, but then you start to slice, well, we could really do good work here if we were able to have something sustainable and longstanding um, and, and the resources were there. But if we have to split that up amongst 15 different groups who work just like this one, um, then it becomes less. And so um, that's sometimes a harsh reality that we're faced with. You know, I know uh, working in this space, you're not necessarily given 
uh, the largest budget. <laughs> so what you have, you have to make work. Um, you know, one small mind shift thing that we had when I got to American is moving from this idea of us being sponsors of these groups and, and organizations um, to partners, right? Just that change in mind shift or the, that mindset where, you know, we're sponsoring this dinner or we're sponsoring this it, it moved now to we're partnering you with this work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, I think that has been really helpful as we have thought about um, partnering with, uh, with the groups that we do, our, our, our nonprofits that we partner with. Um, it has helped us now go on that journey together, right? Um, given, you know, even our situation now, I was talking to some of the panelists before, there was no secret the financial situation Americans in. My partners are reaching out to us to say, I know we can't give you a billion dollars, but we are here and we're thinking about you. Um, and hey, you've been great partners. Don't worry about this year. Um, we want to be able to support you, right? That's what partnership looks like. It's not just always us coming in as you know, as the as the pocketbook to to save these small nonprofit uh, organizations. So. One last thing I'll I'll add, Dr. Todd, is that um, an organization should really think about how are they strategically aligning to a company. Mm -hmm. So if you think about General Motors, Cadillac. You know, we're aligning with STEM and STEAM, you know, arts and culture is really what Cadillac is. You know, when we think about the social space, that's what we're funding and supporting because that um, spurs creativity and that creativity spurs innovation. And so really if um, small nonprofits or organizations who are looking for funding find organizations and companies that align with that. So if you are, for example, if you, um, the blue, Blue Cross and Blue Shield or a pharmaceutical company. Well, if you're um, race for a cure, look for a pharmaceutical company to partner with and sponsor. So really be smart about who you ask um, to support you and partner with. And I think, you know, again, that goes back to the research and some of the fundamentals. So, you know, that way it aligns with their business needs and there's more of a reason or more of a case for a strategic partnership if they do have to spend, you know, to Stephen's point, um, this aligns with their business naturally. And so it's really about going and doing the research so you understand. If you're thinking about a company like Starbucks or Ben & Jerry's or what have you, think about what are the type of companies that they are supporting and have partnerships with and how can your company come to the table with something that allows them to also progress? I think that's, you know, just one of the strategic things. Sometimes people are asking for money and it's like, wait a minute, you haven't looked at the type of stuff that we sponsor, the type of events that we sponsor, the type of causes. And when you do that, then you're really asking a much more direct question and you're coming from a place of knowledge and, and, and being helpful. And then that's really where the best, you know, win-win partnership is. No, I, I really appreciate you um, clarifying that as well as, you know, we're saying this a lot in the chat and, and we, and this is a common question, speaking of the power of research and language um, and the acronym of DNI, DEI, IND, uh, you know, and what is right, what is what is the correct expression? You know, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of companies are now embracing DEI, and a lot of companies don't talk about equity. Um, now we're seeing a, a movement of talking about social justice uh, within this narrative. Any feedback and perspective um, of the terms and concepts? Um, as well as the messaging behind uh, these initiatives to include or om omit certain words, et cetera. Well, um, as an, a point of explanation, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all quote Verne Myers all the time. Um, Diversity is being asked at the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And belonging is feeling, you know, bringing your best dance moves or being asked to plan the playlist, um, you know, or, you know, planning the whole thing, you know. So I think that the, the, um, the graduation of understanding how they all relate to each other and yet they're very different. Um, you know, diversity might be the who and the what, but the inclusion is the how. And to me, the belo belonging is the result of the first two being done really well, really skillfully. Um, because you can't have diversity, if you have diversity but no inclusion, then the diversity isn't going to feel the sense of the belonging. If you have inclusion with no diversity, it's a kumbaya, maybe a, but a very homogeneous group with no 
no potential to innovate. And so the longing is the result we're shooting for. You know, it's that feeling. It's that I'm relaxed here. I, I can kind of focus on the task at hand and not kind of be having these headwinds and microaggressions and, you know, not knowing where I stand. It is the feeling I want for everyone to experience in their professional world, which is that I'm, I can only be creative if I'm relaxed and I'm fully present. And the problem with being the only one in the room or not seeing anyone that looks like you on a regular basis or hearing the things that some of us hear is we're always on our guard. And so we're not able to really be fully present and really bring our true gifts. And that's the tragedy of this, of what we know is happening for so many people. It, it didn't take the last month to tell us that many of us have felt that way for a really long time. So, um, and I like belonging and equity. I agree with you, Todd. I think um, that's really new. I see that more on the West Coast and I see it in more younger companies and more tech. I don't tend to see equity discussed in like the big banks and financial services. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think it's a concept that a lot of people misunderstand. I, I think we got a real lesson in equity for people that didn't know what it was because we looked at what COVID was doing to certain communities, right? That was, to me, I could finally kind of hang my hat on an explanation that people could understand. It was right in front of them. And they finally get that, that equity isn't equality. Equality is a goal, destination, and equity is the strategy that's the lens we need to look at the systems through that are causing differential impact to happen. Pay gaps, promotion and advancement. Um, and equity work is hard work. It's not, it can't just be optics. It's literally getting in there and like changing the system. And I think this is the work ahead. I mean, if companies really want to be real about this, we have to look at those systemic questions and those equity questions. It can't be window dressing anymore. So I think we've got a lot of really courageous, courageous and brave conversations that need to happen around why do we do it this way? Who benefits from us doing it this way? Why have we never questioned this? Why have we let this, uh, this continue? You know, I hope that's what leaders are sitting with right now. And it, this continued under my watch and I didn't know it was happening or I knew and I didn't do anything about it. So this is a really like a very important moment of reckoning, I think for a lot of leaders to say, this was always real, but I think, you know, the, the shame that a lot of people are feeling is like, it's time to take it seriously and do something about it and put a stake in the ground. And I'm, I'm just so here for it. Um, but I hope, I hope equity, it becomes more um, ubiquitous and because that's the actual hard and work that matters for the next generation is going to be the equity work. Great point. And I, and I know we're, all, we're really at time and I, and it's a storm coming in Bentonville, Arkansas right now. So uh, God is asking me uh -oh. to get off very soon. Uh, but I will say this, you know, um, I think whether you start with inclusion, equity, or diversity, uh, or the rearranged order, it's very important for you as the organization to understand what does those terms mean for you all and actually establish common language in your positioning on those terms because everyone show up to those terms very differently based on your experience. And so I will tell organizations for the, you know, to start, let's start with the common vocabulary. You will see that would take time to unpack um, and you will probably see what makes sense for your organization, whether you want to lead with inclusion or lead with diversity, et cetera. But you know, in, in research, you have to understand the history of how diversity came into the workplace from compliance and, and it came from diversity, then it moved to representation and the move to engagement and culture. And so it, it's, it's, some, it's some work there to unpack, but I would just say really start that conversation and also understand you really can't do true diversity, equity, inclusion without talking about social justice, but that's another conversation. Also, it's another conversation that we get. Uh, I know, stay tuned for part two. Uh, but I, I think that's another conversation we hear a lot, too, especially in the community, civic organizations and service organizations. Should we have this conversation? This is a political conversation. We can't talk about this right now because we're talking about politics, especially Black Lives Matter and DNI. And so that's another um, I, I feel like a dialogue, because I don't debate on these issues, but we can have a dialogue to talk more about it. And I think, you know, I would love for the panelists to give us our, your closing thoughts on um, just reflections or anything you want to give as recommendations to um, individuals who are looking to strengthen this work or start this work that has not been covered um, previously. So last minute thoughts, we'll start with 
uh, Stephen. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, my, my last parting gift, if you will, um, you know, of, opinions are important, right? Just like you said, Todd, I, I don't do a lot of debating in the space. I listen and I learn. Um, but opinions are, are important. And uh, if we were at a basketball game, my opinion of my team versus your team, rightfully so, um, our opinions will never trump someone's experience. And so we have to be open and listen to that experience and act on it. It does not matter um, if I have a different opinion about your experience, your experience is one that you've lived. And I think for many companies, it's about putting all of those experiences together and getting to a place and doing that work in equity so that we can get to that belonging and inclusion and all of those other things, right? We, we understand that we can go out and buy top, top, top talent, but how do you make sustainable, long-lasting change? I think that's the work that we're doing every single day. That's the work that we have to do on and off the clock. So um, those are my final words. Your, your opinions can never trump someone's experience. Thank you, Stephen, for your gift, giving the gift to the world. Ms. Alexis? Um, well, first of all, I want to say, Dr. Jenkins, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this illustrious panel. Um, I actually learned a lot today, but my, my parting road words really are around, keep your foot on the gas. <laughs> June was absolutely exhausting with Black Lives Matter, um, Pride Month, Black Music Month. Who knows what's next? Um, but I will say, keep your foot on the gas. You don't. We don't know how long this will last. We don't know how long this will be a focus. We we don't know a lot of things. COVID taught us that. Um, so so keep your foot on the gas um, and continue to progress and progress with a really positive attitude, expecting that the outcome is going to be great. If you have these outcomes of it's going to be just like it was the last fifty years. For you, it will be, you know, my attitude in working with Cadillac and, and um, community partners and other brands is that this is going to still be a great year, 2020. And if we think about the past recession in 2008, there was a lot of companies that evolved with an epic technology and sustained themselves. And so, you know, we at Cadillac will also to sustain ourselves, we'll be here. We are sincerely here for the community. Um, so feel free to reach out to me directly. I'd love to hear from you. Instagram um, at I am Alexis Kerr. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you, Alexis. Thank you so much for being here. Mr. Reggie. Yeah, I'll make it quick. And, and once again, I just want to thank everyone on the panel as well as our fabulous moderator for keeping us on, on task. Um, and, and what I'll say quickly is uh, one of the things that I love about this space is that it forces you to be a continuous learner because working in the IND space, um, this is something that is never stagnant. And so my advice to anyone out here who's listening or, or who wants to get into the DEI space is learn, 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 be quite honest. And, and, and really learn about it from a global perspective, right? Just don't think about the work from what's happening here in the States. You really have to look at what it looks like from other cultures, from other perspectives, from other countries. Um, but if you continue to be that continuous learner, I think it'll help not only you, but all of us as in this work, none of us are competitors. Even if I had three other apparel companies up here, it would still be, how can we learn from each other? So that would be my word for everyone and my advice for everyone. There we go. You heard it. You heard it from himself. There we go. Mic drop. Last but definitely not least. So Ms. Good. Brown. Oh, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. I have tons of notes. Um, I want to speak to the the non-black folks on the call to say, you know, watch out for fragility, for overwhelm. Um, watch yourself and your pacing as you learn a lot. I mean, there is a lot happening that is causing a lot of aha moments and hard realizations. Um, and we need to do all this together. And so um, it's a muscle, though, that a lot of people haven't developed. Uh, and so what I'm really excited to think about is how can we, how can we give folks enough to, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable, but not so overwhelmed with the moment and the extent of change um, and all the feelings that are coming with it so as not to do anything. Uh, because we're going to have to do this together. And I think um, I hope to come out of this with a, more of a partnership, a true 
true carrying the water with each other versus the diversity team does that and takes care of it, right? Which has been unfair, unrealistic, because <laughs> this work is always changing, right? We just, you know, you talked about it, Reggie. It's an impossible job to know everything you need to know, and then you're responsible for leading it for a giant company as well with very few resources, et cetera. So I think um, we have to work smarter, not harder. And think of it like a relay race. If you have really good allies and accomplices, if you can pass that baton off and somebody can run with it for a while, that's how we, how we partner to get it done. And so I think we've got to think about ourselves as nodes and you know, line up our allies and, and think about who can do what and include more people and involve more people in very intentional ways in getting this done. Because I think it's been very hard road to keep pushing as the few. Um, and we've got to somehow figure out how to crack through that inaction and sitting on the sidelines and really pull people in in a meaningful way. So I shared a, an article in the chat called Uncovering Talent. And um, we learned that straight white men cover in the workplace. A lot of invisible diversity dimensions are held by a lot of us. And so perhaps we can shift the conversation to one that's more inclusive where people can say, wait a second, that's my issue too. I know something about that. And we've got to get better at that because otherwise there's still going to be this, oh, it'll be taken care of by somebody else. And I, I just can't abide that. So uh, please, you know, take action, enlist others, um, give people specifics to do right now. Because if people are floundering, um, get them out of flounder and overwhelm into action. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a really interesting time. Alexis, I love your positive read. You know, that 2020 is going to be one for the history books. <laughs> That is for sure. We, we're going to survive and we're going to be better. We're going to be better for all of this. I know. We already are. We already yeah. are. And I, this, is, this conversation, if I'm getting all my friends together in one place, has been for the history books. And I am so, <laughs> so, so blessed to have you guys all in my life. And I'm so appreciative for all that you do um, in your world, uh, on and off the clock. And what a powerful conversation we had today. Um, and thank you all so much for being here. And most importantly, thank you all to all the audience that's tuning in from all over the world um, and bringing your heart and your willingness to engage and learn. Um, I ask that you really take some of the tips today and share it with others. You know, really put these tips and recommendations into actions and really think about what is your role in champion diversity, equity, and inclusion on and off the clock. So thank you.